Um, how's everybody doing today? Pretty good. Okay. Um, um, thank you guys very much for coming. Today we have a very special guest. Um, and today we're trying to do something a little bit different. We've got someone coming from the National Mining Hall of Fame. Um, and we have a couple of guests from externals of the school. So thank you guys very much for coming. Um, we do this every Wednesday. We try to invite you guys with some decent food, so I hope you guys got to enjoy your meals tonight. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Tonight, our presenter is talking about the challenges of mine planning and lead planning. Uh, Steve Sorger has got an extensive background in working with Newmont within the planning district. Um, I've had the honor of getting to work with him over the years. He's a great person. So I'm really excited to see what all he has to share with us tonight. And thank you guys so much for coming. Oh, and there's the sign in sheet. In case you guys didn't get the sign in sheet, thank you guys very much. Do not say it with me, sir. Thanks, sir. We're just working in the room to get rid of an echo. So give us just a second. I guess it's a good time to bring it up. And I might just be kind of close. Sure. So I'll, I'll try to get started and see how the echo is. And start the presentation. So, again, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about challenges in mine planning and uh, what the Can I eat this? Okay. Oh, it's the sound from this computer. Yes. Now it should be working. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned, I've worked in Newmont for 32 years before retiring in 2020. Um, in my semi-retirement, I'm also doing consulting work with Big View Mind Planning. So that's my quick sales pitch. Um, doing some mind planning research, doing re reconciliation detective work, and also doing mind planning consulting and auditing. But during my time in Newmont, um, I worked in a variety of planning roles at site in the region and at corporate. And during that time, I, I was both on the giving and receiving end of this plan isn't good enough. I need a new plan. And that certainly uh, has stuck with me, whether I was at the site, the region or the corporate office. But um, my educational background, I graduated from Michigan Tech in mining engineering and then stayed on and got a PhD in engineering. Okay.
So I'll do my best to keep talking and uh, keep the microphone away from the, the computer. But uh, during the talk, again, thanks to the School of Mines for inviting me here. I talked to Kadri about possibly talking to some of his classes, and then that turned into talking to the Mines Alumni Network and also advertising through the National Mining Hall of Fame. And within the talk, I'm going to be talking about some inductees to the Hall of Fame that I've crossed paths with during my time at Newmont. Um, but the full disclaimer is this is all based on my views and my uh, memory. So the facts may not ag be agreed to by everyone at Newmont or elsewhere. So at Yanacocha, um, the mine started up in 1993 just as Peru was escaping a whole period of terrorism with the Shining Path. Um, so it was considered very risky at the time. Um, it's basically been an open pit uh, mine with truck shovel haulage and almost all of the ore being sent to leach pads uh, with very quick recovery, very surprisingly easy metallurgy. Um, by 2000, it was producing 1.8 million ounces per year. And then by 2004, it had ramped up to over 3 million ounces per year, which still wasn't quite the largest gold mine in the world at the time. That was in Grasberg in Indonesia. Um, but almost as fast as it ramped up, it started ramping down. And by 2014, it was producing less than a million ounces per year. And of course, now we're throwing some things up here. Okay, so um, we really want to start talking a little bit about mine planning theory and practice. The whole reason we make mine plans is because we're trying to achieve some type of goal, and. Typically, that goal is to maximize value. But as Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And so that's really the key starting point is what do we want to do for our, our mind plan? And sorry, this echo is really bothering me too. Uh, So the, another thing he said was, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but I promise you in practice there is. And I think that's something really important I want to share with the audience here, especially with the student audience. Um, everything you do will be based in theory. Theory is an important part of practice, but it's not the whole part of practice. Probably. So. So if we start with an open pit mine planning process, the um, I'll say there's there's three main steps in the process. And again, if this microphone is still working, if you're online, we're still trying to debug your microphone problem here. Yes, thank you. Okay, so 
In terms of mind planning, we'll talk about the theory. Share your screen with me. Oh, now we need to share the screen back to need to share the screen with uh, Zoom. Okay, thanks and apologies. So, so in our first step, we're going to try to build an ultimate bit design. Our key goal is really to get a maximum value bit. And what that means is if the bit goes deeper, we lose money. And if it's more shallow, we lose money. And so we're trying to find that sweet spot where that last slice that's mined out of the ground still gives us some incremental profit. Um, that takes a lot of inputs in terms of grade model that tells us where all the metal is in the ground. We need to know how steep our slopes could be in different zones. And we need to understand our costs, our recoveries, and metal prices. But again, from a theoretical point of view, those are all inputs. And in terms of outputs, we get that sort of map of what is the final pit geometry. Still takes a little bit of work to, to build some road designs and keep it as an optimum pit. Then our next step, we're going to take that pit design and we're going to build a mine and process schedule. So in this map here, um, this is looking at a cross section through this particular pit. And it's been split into a series of laybacks. And the progress through the laybacks is mapped to the different years. And then these individual blocks here are representing how much profit we're going to get from mining a particular block. Um, and so here, our goal is really to maximize net present value subject to a whole series of capacity constraints and maybe some blending constraints and some other constraints. But the general idea is we want to mine the best slice first and take the more marginal slice and defer that into the future. Um, so coming out of that, we'll end up with a map for what does the pit look like at the end of each year. Uh, we'll build similar maps for dumps, uh, for leach pads, possibly for tail stands. And then we'll also define some cutoff grades that decides in a given year do the yellow blocks go to the process facility or the waste dump or to a stockpile. Then when that's done, we'll finally build a whole series of reports. And hopefully we're going to build some very simple ones for management to say, yes, I like that grade profile or yes, I like that production profile. And then we'll also build a lot more complicated ones for operators so that they have instructions on, yes, this is how the open pit's gonna develop over time. We can make that happen. And we know we're gonna have the necessary permits, the necessary dewatering and some other key milestones. So again, that's our theory for maximizing value. And it's a good theory. But in practice, there's a whole lot of uncertainty in where do all these inputs come from? And so if we take the idea of ore reserves, um, I may not have my numbers exactly right, but if something's measured, then there's probably a 90% chance that any given year is gonna be plus or minus 15%. And if something's indicated, maybe it's gonna be an 80 or 75% chance that it's gonna be plus or minus 15%. And that sounds good until you think about an 80% chance means that one out of five, years is going to be greater than 15% away from what we estimated. So that's that's pretty uh, challenging to work with. And it's even more challenging for the whole geophysical process to get something that's even that accurate. Um, we'll have uncertainty in our slope angles. We'll have uncertainty in our metallurgical recoveries. And we'll especially have uncertainty in our metal price. Um, those are just uncertainties, but other difficulties are going to come up in who's going to actually figure out what is the cost of mining a ton of rock. When you're in school, it's very nice because 
Cadre or you said, here's your cost per ton, go do some calculations. Um, but if you're working on a new project, it's going to be a lot of work to find similar projects, find cost information, figure out how many people are going to be in the mine, how many trucks, how many dozers, how many graders. If you're at an existing mine, you may already know how many trucks, trucks dozers, and graders. But all those numbers are going to be in an accounting system that works great for accountants. But it's probably going to take a fair bit of work to figure out, okay, I need to grab this account, this account, and this account to grab all of my mining operating costs. And by the way, I've got a whole list of capital projects that accounting says they're capital, but they're still essentially a variable cost where one additional ton of rock mined is going to require additional capital. But just as an example of some of these uncertainties, um, if we take a look at the gold price over the last 15 years, if you were going to plan a mine in, in say 2010, the question would be, what gold price should I use? Do I just say, well, it's 1100 today, let's just use 1100. And maybe that looks good and conservative if you only look at the past because that's all you can see. But you would have been in very good luck if you designed at 1100 in 2010. If you get up to, to 2013, boy, it sure looks like 1600 is a very conservative gold price. And unfortunately, it wasn't. So if you designed your mine here, you probably mined a lot of material that didn't make any profit over the next several years. Um, and so that's where, again, I, I don't know if it was luck, conservatism, or what, but certainly Newmont was very slow to, to increase its planning price and finally settled on 1200 in these sorts of years and still got really nervous in 2016 when it started to dip below 1200. So again, those are some examples of uncertainties you're gonna run into in the planning process. Metal price is actually not too bad for engineers because usually somebody in the corporate office is gonna tell you what to use. But when it comes to some of these other parameters, you'll be on your own to figure out what sort of costs to be using. Uh, let's talk about another big challenge in the planning world is once you've made that first plan, all of a sudden everybody remembers every number that was in that plan. And so when you go to make your second plan, the process becomes a whole lot different. And basically that becomes the measuring stick. And if you give a number that's better, that's great, even if there was a mistake in that better number, because that just became the new number. But if you give a number that's lower, there's a good chance that somebody in your chain of command is gonna say, that's not good enough, try again. Um, and the problem is it may look worse in production costs. Uh, maybe it looks better in terms of headcount, but there might be three or four numbers that look wrong. And oftentimes, the man, if you ask your manager, well, which number do you want me to fix? The answer will be, well, I don't know, just give me a better plan and I'll know it's, I'll know it's better when I see it. So be prepared for a fair bit of back and forth with your manager. Uh, in this sort of example here, if this was, say, a, a brand new project and the first plan that the board of directors saw said the, the production was going to be in blue, if you come back with a plan like this, there's a good thing. There's a good chance the project manager is going to say, "Well, that's not good enough. Um, I really need you to to look at. Can you maybe add more trucks, look, raise the cutoff grade, or do something to get those red lines closer to the blue lines?" Um, I think a really important thing to say here is that it's better to have that back and forth. Because if you automatically do something like this and get it to match the blue plan, then your manager is going to have no idea of what the risk is in the plan. So it's always good to be sharing your problems upwards. And your boss will give you a pretty clear idea if you're oversharing and you'll calibrate to the right spot. But in this sort of example, let's say you make a plan with more trucks and a higher cutoff grade. 
and you show it and probably the first question a project manager is going to ask is oh that raised my initial capital and i'm totally graded on what's my initial capital for the project so can you make that plan work with more trucks happening in year two instead of year one um and if you tell them yeah here's the initial capital impact here's the mvp impact after you've moved the trucks to year two, he may forget about the MBV impacts and say, yep, good enough. I've met my production profile, I've met my initial capital, and we've got a new plan ready to, to go. So again, those are some of the examples of trade-offs and back solving that you're gonna have to do. So again, theory and practice are different, but that's not to say that the practice is wrong. Practice has some very real impacts. Um, here's a case where the plan actually did meet up with the actuality. And I don't know how Tom McCovey did it, but he built a $5.5 billion project in Peru in the middle of COVID and came in on time and on budget. At least that's the public publicly reported numbers. I'm sure there's a secret there somewhere. Um, and again, I shouldn't say that because I, I know nothing about the situation. But again, that's a case where the actual is judged against the plan and met the plan and everybody was happy. If the plan had been 5.9 billion and he met the 5.9 billion, everybody still would have been happy because it's it tends to be about what's the plan you put out and do you meet the plan? So it's really important to get those public numbers right and achievable. So here's a case, here's a headline from 2019, where Newmont Gold Corp um, had to change their plan. And because of that, they provided lower guidance to the market. And in one day, Newmont stock lost at its peak, I think it lost over 5% of its value. And by the end of the day, it had settled down at 3% of its value. So a billion dollars lost in one day based on a change in plans. And that was certainly not the first time I've seen this happen to Newmont or Barrick or many other companies. So again, making those changes in plans is a really big deal. And what's at the core of those plans are probably mine plans, but it's important to know that eventually your mind planning work even your first year out of school may get up to the ceo and so when you do have bad news don't keep it to yourself you've got to share that and let other people help you work through it so maybe that's a bad story but here's a really ugly headline um, where the marginal project went from 500 million up to 800 million in its cost estimate it's since gone higher, but that's a case where, again, you can read the headline of the CEO's fired after the plan had to be revised. Um, so I'll tell you a personal experience where I had to deal with the difference between theory and practice. And there's a bit of justice in this story because I was in the corporate office and I was part of giving the theory to the sites about wanting them to be extra sure that when they did their fit limit analysis that every cost was accounted for and at the same time we also said um, we want you to include some discount rate effects in your pit limit and that was new at the time oh and by the way this was one of those cases where the gold price was headed down I think it was just about at an all-time low of 275 per ounce. And so we ran our pits. Sorry, after I gave that guidance from corporate, then I switched jobs to when I went where I went to Yanagocha. Had to live with my uh, theory. And in practice, using those input assumptions made significantly smaller pits. So it took a little bit of time to make sure all the numbers were right. And then my boss had a little bit better sense of practice than I did. And he said, well, this is big news. We better get on a plane and go back to Denver and explain this to the folks in Denver. So my wife, Jenny, had just moved to Cajamarca 
And I got to tell her, oh, sorry, I'm going to go to Denver, so I'll be back in a week. Um, but we did get some very good executive guidance. Um, it happened that one of our operations leader, uh, he started his career many, many years ago as a draftsman. And he liked to use the term sharpen your pencil. And so we did sharpen our pencil on some of our costs and got a better accounting of what belonged as a mining cost versus a processing cost versus an overhead cost. The other big change was we said, okay, the gold price is going down, but also the oil price is going down. So we re recalibrated our oil costs. And then we went back and looked at some of the new models and found a few flaws where they were being too conservative. Um, but again, that was certainly a, a very stressful welcome to the Anacocha property to have to go from a, oh my goodness, where are the reserves to, okay, we've got the reserves under control. Um, so again, theory and practice are both important. Excuse me, need to get unfrozen here. So here I wanna talk a little bit more about um, I want to talk a little bit about theory and practice in terms of some mining hall of fame inductees. Um, I, I can promise you, I did not meet Seely Mudd, um, but he was a mining engineer in the 1800s. Um, he was actually the originator of, of where Cypress Mines came from, which merged with AMAX, which merged with Phelps Dodge, which merged with Freeport. Um, but he, um, he, he was an expert in practice, but when he died, he left a lot of money to the Society of Mining Engineers to fund textbooks. Um, so these are actually some of the first textbooks I learned with. Uh, this is Surface Mining First Edition, which just recently went up to Surface Mining Third Edition. Um, so I thought that was interesting how his career went full circle from practice to theory. And then I also got to work with um, just briefly with Gordon Parker, he was Newmont's CEO when I joined the company in 1988. He came from South Africa to Montana Tech because he wanted to learn something different. He learned both mine engineering and mineral processing. And at the time I joined the company, Newmont was right in the middle of one takeover attempt after another after another. And I was so busy with my theory on indicator creeping and long-term planning that I really had no clue what was going on in terms of all of this takeover attempt. So I think that was one regret was that I was so focused on my theory of, of learning about mine planning that I didn't get a chance to really learn what was happening at that time as Newmont was defending all of these different takeovers. Um, move on to talk about another challenge in mine planning. Again, when we talked about theory, we talked about this idea of maximizing value. And in specifically, we talked about net present value, which is a kind of a weighted average of how much money am I going to make in year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. And that always sounds good until it's time to work on year one. Um, and so when you get to year one, Again, we come back to some of these expectations where there's going to be different metrics that are going to get managed in year one. And oftentimes that depends on the style of your leader. Um, allegedly, Peter Drucker said what gets measured gets managed. Uh, someone else pointed out that it gets managed even when it's pointless to measure it and manage it, and even if it arms the purpose of the organization to do so. And I think that's that's going to be another challenge you run into. I'll give a quick example um, at Yanacocha. Yanacocha had a government-required profit-sharing plan, and in its original configuration, um, this is oversimplifying slightly, but basically there was a percentage of profit, and that got divided by the number of employees and given to the employees. So as you might imagine, management there was very reluctant to add employees because that would be another slice of the pie. Um, 
So definitely they had contract mining. The thing that always struck me when I went to visit was the bathrooms were all were always a little bit dirty because they only wanted to hire one janitor for all the bathrooms on site. Um, eventually that did get modified to where there was a cap of 24 months worth of salary for a bonus. And when that happened, then there was a lot more incentive to go ahead and grow the property, hire more people, switch from contract mining to owner mining. And again, I'm not saying that, that the bonus drove all of those behaviors, but I will say that I've seen bonuses drive some interesting behaviors at, at all of the different mines I've worked at. Um, whether the bonus is tied to production, whether it's tied to profits, whether it's tied to um, safety or anything, it, it will definitely get managed for better or for worse. Um, as an industry, I'll also point out the gold industry um, has had these standard metrics like cost applicable to sales, which is effectively an operating cost. And that was something that was popular when the gold price was really low and companies wanted to emphasize that, well, we're at least covering our operating costs. Pay no attention to those capital costs that we're spending or some of those other costs. And over time, investors complained about that. And so new cost metrics were made um, all in sustaining costs, which includes sustaining capital. And so now there may be some um, company or, or there is an incentive to basically invest in, say, in a bigger mill as development capital and avoid paying uh, sustaining capital to make that sort of cost metric look better. But again, just emphasizing that as an engineer, you're going to have to understand what are some of the key metrics that your executives are looking at, even though those metrics may not tie to the idea of figuring out the cash flow from a property. Uh, do you want to point out that some metrics are not negotiable? And also there's some areas that are non-negotiable that don't have metrics. But certainly I was I was proud of the work at Newmont um, where, where safety was a big priority. Um, in these photos here, this is a water treatment plant with some dirty water coming in and some clean water going out. More water treatment through ion exchange. Um, actually, I think these are membranes. And then here, um, this was a very successful project, which was testing, um, basically doing an early test on final reclamation to prove that we could do a good job of reclaiming the leach pads. So keep those non-negotiables in mind as you're building your plans. Uh, when I was at Yanacocha, I had the chance to work with another Mining Hall of Fame inductee, Alberto Benavides. Um, when I when I got to present plans to him in his Lima office, he would be in his corporate library surrounded by 50 years worth of geology books. And we'd all get to sit down in the boardroom and he would very patiently uh, pour himself a cup of coffee, put it in his walker and push it back across the conference room to his seat and was just completely fully engaged even in his 80s. Um, so I, I aspire to have that level of, of thoughtfulness when I'm that old. But um, he, again, he was an expert in geology as well as mining and as well as business. But he would always ask lots of questions about environmental and social responsibility. Um, the same for Len Harris, who was Newmont's general manager. Um, and he was a, a, a metallurgist by trade, but he was the original general manager at Yanacocha during its startup. And again, he would ask lots of questions about metallurgy, but he would ask just as many questions about environmental and social responsibility. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some financial metrics that I also learned about from some of Hall of Fame inductees. When Pierre, Pierre Lassonde, uh 
truly has a golden touch and oftentimes he has a golden jacket when you see him at a, at a social function but he um his initial two million dollar purchase of gold strike royalties basically made him rich and it really started the whole royalty business he was newmont's president from 2002 to 2007 when he merged his company with newmont and normandy mining um at the end of 2007, he had had enough of a big company and he went back and he refounded his, his Franco Nevada company again in 2008. But the first time I got to meet him, he came to Yanacocha for a site visit um, shortly after he had traded a fraction of his ownership for a fraction of Bidmont ownership. And he got there and his kind of assessment was, it's a gold mine for everyone but the company. And the reason for that was it was really in the middle of a heavy growth period. So whatever cash the mine was generating was then being turned into more investment to get even bigger. So it's not that the mine wasn't profitable, but the mine wasn't returning cash. Um, and so he had a very simple question. There may have been an extra word or two mixed into the sentence, but basically asked, when do I get my money back? And the challenge is, if you're in a big growth mode, pretty much you don't start getting your money back until you plateau out and you stop investing further. Um, so I think this was some of the seeds of Newmont having a, a change of, of its primary metric. Before, I, I would say, and again, this is my opinion, it's not necessarily true, but I would say that before 2000, Newmont's approach was Let's get as many projects as we can. And if it's got a, a good NPV, good rate of return, we'll find a way to borrow money and invest in that project. And I think with Pierre Lassonde's thinking, and I think definitely continued by Gary Goldberg when he arrived in 2013. Also, when the market condition shifted a little bit and the market stopped rewarding growth. Um, but both of these leaders were we're basically saying that NPV is very important, but we need to measure our capital investment out so that we're always returning cash. And so that's when the term of grow margins and mine life and not so much grow yearly production uh, became part of the, the way of thinking a new one. And again, I think that's really been very helpful for the company over the last 15 years. And I think a lot of our shareholders appreciate that approach that allows Newmont to keep paying dividends. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, um, and again, we talked about how those plans keep changing, the metrics keep changing, and the reality is plans keep changing. And I, as I was researching this presentation, I ran across a quote from Taylor Swift. I didn't know she was a planning expert, but... I think her quote is very correct that just because you made a good plan doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, and again, there's always something going wrong, whether it's the gold wasn't in the ground where you thought it was, whether the, the trucks aren't moving quite as fast. And if you give up on your plan, then you're probably going to give up on your goal. So it's important to keep the goal, but change the plan. Um, when my team of regional planners got frustrated with me because I kept asking for another forecast. <laughs> I used to tell them, well, the planning will continue until the plan is achieved. And that uh, there's, there's probably a footnote to that or until we run out of time and have to submit something. <laughs> but, um, so, so again, when, our, when something is not going according to plan, we don't give up on the goal, we change the plan. Um, we've talked about lots of reasons why plans end up not working. Number one is really things like geologic variability, but sometimes we have bad planning assumptions. Sometimes we have operations that aren't meeting those assumptions. Uh, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. And every once in a while, we get certain factors like uh, a big rain event fills up the bottom of the pit where we were expecting to mine our hydrate. Um, so 
I've always worked with this sort of simple plan do check act idea. Um, and so again, we make a plan, operations generally does the doing, and then we work with operations to see are we achieving the plan or not. And if we're not, then that's where the fun starts, where we've got to do a lot of detective work to figure out why we're not meeting the plan and how we're going to act on it. But what what I had no idea until I moved from theory to practice was that when I was at the mine site, I spent some time planning, but most of my time was on checking and working with the team on figuring out what the actions were going to be. Um, and again, checking means it's a, a, a reconciling process of what did the plan say, what did we do, and then a fair bit of detective work. Again, this is a really important place where you need the teamwork, because if you just go back to operations and say, oh, you're not moving enough tons, generally they're higher in the food chain than you are. And so you need that teamwork to get them to, to buy into the variance analysis and the detective work. Um, so I'll talk about another stressful case in Yanacocha. When I look back on stressful cases in my career, a lot of them seem to come from being in Yanacocha. Um, as, as my friend used to say, when you're at the mine site, you're at the pointy end of the stick. And, um, but in this case here, we had a, over time, we developed a whole series of monthly reconciliations to look at block models, to look at how much gold we mine versus what the exploration model said. And it's always hard because any one month is going to be plus or minus a fair bit. So you need a few months in a row to tell you that there's a problem. But we finally figured out that yes, we definitely had a problem on tons mined. And this was really stressful because at this point in my time in Yanacocha, I've been there like two and a half years, I think. And the mine manager had just recently come from another mine site, and he was highly respected, also a higher grade level. And so it's hard to say, okay, is there a problem with operations or is there a problem with planning? And so again, that's where it was really good that we we had the teamwork that we said, well, we're not going to make any assumptions. We're just going to start to put in place the programs to figure out where the problem is. And we found a lot of disconnects, but the two biggest disconnects we found were that in certain cases our trucks just weren't moving the way they were supposed to and the most notable was on a steep ramp the trucks were supposed to be in second gear but most of the trucks were in first gear and then when we got to some of the flat halls or even downhill the trucks were hesitant to go above a certain peak speed and so we actually we used our truck dispatching system to prove some of this by almost setting up a virtual speed trap in the truck dispatching system. But then when it came time to do the, the training, it was actually just most helpful to get one of these types of setups on a trailer and put it on key places and let the trucks themselves see what their speed was versus what the target speed was. Um, the other, the other issue, the big, the other biggest issue we found was a planning problem, where in this particular Quinoa pit, we were putting down somewhere between a half meter and a meter of hard rock on top of this very muddy, gravelly ore body to prevent the trucks from sinking in, and so that tonnage that was constantly circulating around wasn't factored into our calculations enough. Um, but again, the, the nice thing was we worked together and made it made it work. Um, just another quick note on another Hall of Fame inductee, Harry Parker, uh, passed away recently. Um, but he he was probably the world's authority on estimating how much gold or copper or lignite was in the ground. Traveled all over the world. Um, fun fact was. He was an air sick bag collector, so I don't I don't even know if they have barf bags in planes anymore, but he uh, he was always taking one with him when he went. But he um I got to meet him at Gold Quarry 
where the banks had hired in to make sure that the Newmont reserves were adequate before they would basically buy the Newmont roaster and then uh, lease it back to us to use for 20 years. He also came to Anacocha where we had a very good problem with our reconciliation in that the model was actually underestimating how much gold uh, was in the ground. And I think that's the only mine site I've ever been at that has had that problem. But he helped us resolve what was going on and make adjustments accordingly. So I want to talk about one last challenge. Um, and it's really, it's, it's the way to overcome a lot of the earlier challenges. And that's how do you build some flexibility into your plan in order to account for uncertainty? Um, and I think that that idea of flexibility and understanding what could be uh, happening and what could go wrong is why Dwight Eisenhower said plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Um, again, a, a different authority on planning said everyone has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> um, and trust me, as a mind planner, you will get hit in the mouth quite a few times, but who knows which way it's coming from. So in terms of how can you build flexibility in your plans? I think one of the key things is to make sure you're aware of where are the most likely areas of shortfalls going to come from. At Yanacocha, we were particularly concerned about our whether the gold was going to be in the right place or not. Um, always concerned about would we move enough tons with our trucks. And then another big one was every year we would put new plastic down to expand our lease pads. And that work could only happen in the dry season. So sometimes that work would get a late start if the dry season was late. And then that would only give, you know, that would take away two out of the 10 weeks we had at the end of the year to get gold from that new plastic. Um, so, so the key is have some contingency plans. Also remember that if you're gonna fix year one, well, Fixing year one is probably the biggest priority because if you don't get through year one, you might not have a chance to, to talk about how good your year two is. Um, and again, these are trade-offs. Sometimes there are extra costs involved. So don't do that alone as an engineer. Make sure you're working through your chain of command. Um, so in at Yanacocha, um, our biggest flexibility lever when I first arrived was we had a fleet of small old trucks that had been retired. But in the early years, we, we could fire those up and get some extra capacity. Um, and we could also do our standard thing of mine faster in the high grade low back laybacks and slower in the in the low grade laybacks. Um, so we tried to always be aware of the consequences. And hopefully by the time we got to year two, then we'd have a chance to buy more trucks and fix any problem that way. Or in the case of Yanacocha, we were still in the early stages of exploration success. So sometimes there would be new material that could solve any problems in year two of the plan. We were always comparing ourselves to Batu Ijao. Um, and they had similar issues, although their, in their case, rainy season was a big deal because that could prevent them from operating in the bottom of the pit for six months or in a really bad year, seven or eight months. Um, but there, um, again, this is another theory versus practice case. When the Batu Hijau plan was built, the mine manager was very insistent that his mine plan have basically short, it could have short hauls to the closest parts of the waste dump and then just keep getting longer and longer as the mine went on. But he said, no, I'm going to haul to the average point so that I have a constant haul distance through the life of mine. And to me, that was a waste because you were spending money early. And it wasn't until I got to Yanacocha, I don't know, five or six years later that the light bulb went on of, 
he never planned to do that in the first place. He just wanted to have a safety valve so that if he was behind on tons, he could do the short haul instead of doing the average distance haul. And that proved to be a really good flexibility lever. And again, a nice uh, reminder of theory versus practice for me. And the, the good thing was when you take the short haul, you actually look good on tons and you look good on costs. And it's not until next year or the year after that you actually have to pay for that. And in their case, they were trying to fix year two by always going to higher and higher mill throughput. Um, then they had planned and used that to sort of offset the, the penalties of longer hauls. Um, so again, we were a little bit competitive between the two sites and I didn't realize how much we were until we get to the end of this story. But um, at Yanacocha, we always thought that um, we should follow this quote of it's better to aim high and miss than to aim low and hit. And we always accused uh, Batahija of being sandbaggers and setting a very low, um, a very low target. And so if you were to ask us, we were maximizing our assets potential by getting high. And they were a bunch of sandbaggers because they had a lot of slack in their play. If you were to ask them, they would just say, uh, we're a bunch of heroes and you're a bunch of underachievers. Um, so that that grained on me, that graded on me, but it graded on me more when we learned that our management <laughs> basically said, oh, Batu's the achievers and we're the underachievers. So that was a, a little bit of a, a strong lesson for me. And that's why we ended up getting uh, several key Batu Hijau people to come to Yanagocha and help us be more efficient. Uh, so I, I would say this is the one quote in the presentation that I don't agree with anymore. Um, and just say, wherever you aim, plan to hit the target. Uh, so to, to recap, again, we're making our plans to achieve goals. We've discussed a couple of key, um, key challenges in mind planning that lead to a lot of mind replanning. Um, and the most important one here is that planning for flexibility helps ease some of those problems of having to replan again and again and increases our chances of hitting the goals. And again, don't pay any attention to the last slide's quote. Just remember, wherever you aim, plan to hit the target. Just put a couple of references um, in terms of theory, practice, and history. Again, thanks to the National Mining Hall of Fame for, for helping to publicize the talk. And hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about the inductees. And again, thanks for your attention and open it up for questions or Sarah's gonna tell us what's next. Can, can you hear me? This is Corby Anderson. Or questions. Anyways, um, so so I don't know if you remember Darren Hall, he was engineer or whatever at it. He was my boss who taught me taught me about the pointy end of the stick and all right. Quite a bit about practice. So when he was head of my planning at, at Fatahija. He did an exercise for us where he actually looked back in time and then looked at it going forward of changing the paradigm about mining the best stuff first. And so his plan was based on mining the low grade during low prices and mining the high grades during high prices to the extent that you could, right? Your body fixes with you and not doing it. And that that plan, when it was run out, made a huge amount more money than doing it the standard way. And, and we were all really impressed with it, but no one ever picked up on that. I'm just curious what your thought was on that, because it's a totally different way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so 
Yes, it's great. <laughs> if you can tell me in in 2012, can you tell me is that a high price period or is that a low price period? Um, and I think again, if you were to look at Yanacocha's production profile. I mean, if you take this graph back here, if the gold price would keep going down, and Yanacocha's production profile would have basically peaked and started going down, this is the gold price was starting to go up, which on a single asset basis would tell you it would have been much better to go slow at Yanacocha if you knew in advance what the price was going to be. But I think. The flip side of that is, can you actually afford to mine the low grade when the price is low? And I think that's where, even though in hindsight, Yanacocha would have worked better if it had been delayed five or eight years, um, it was still the key engine that allowed Newmont to grow. And with that growth, even though Yanacocha was trailing off after 2006, the growth that Yanacocha had enabled allowed those other mines to keep growing and allowed Newmont as a whole to keep growing. But it's certainly a, a big challenge on how, what, how do you anticipate prices? And if you knew what the prices were going to be, would you do something different with your mine plan? To just, yep, I'll answer questions instead of getting philosophical. <laughs> Steve, can you make a comment on optimization and the operation research techniques used in mind planning? Yeah. Um, I can make a comment just real quick that, um, again, this, this sort of picture here that we looked at was, was kind of the standard maybe in 2000 and 2010, where first you make an open pit, an ultimate pit, then you make laybacks, and then you do some scheduling. And there are algorithms to do this. There are algorithms to do that. And today, the big research challenge is, um, which I think Kadri and many others are working on, is can you skip these two steps and do this in one step all together? And maybe you're going to come up with, well, at, at the bare minimum, you shouldn't be able to come up with a plan that's just as good, but because you have less constraints, maybe you can come up with something significantly better by not forcing yourself into this two-step process. And how well you use this, uh, some of these tools in Nevada, for example? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of some of these one-step tools, um, after... After I worked in Yanacocha, uh, my career path moved me more into finance and less, away, less into mine planning. So I didn't actually get a chance to see how some of those tools are being used in more state-of-the-art operations today. But, but again, I, I think in this particular deposit, this is actually the Penasquito deposit, which has two separate pits. And I think some of those techniques would work really well and much better than the nested pit analysis in cases where you have two or more pits or where you have long tabular ore bodies. So um, I have a question about the last uh, quotes, like on the last uh, couple of slides that you had. Um, because to me, I should say, like, it made sense to me is semantically, right? You know, it's better to, wherever you aim, plan hit the target. But then uh, isn't that also kind of saying like, well, it doesn't matter what you're planning, just make sure that you achieve what the plan was. Yeah, uh, I think that's where both, both are important. Yeah. And normally somebody else <laughs> will have already set a bar that's really high for you. But I think the idea is if you set the bar high, don't, don't raise it even higher. Okay. Just to try to think if there's like a pole vault analogy, but make sure you clear the bar, but don't try to clear the bar by five feet. Okay, I see what you mean there. Because at first I thought what you were trying to say was, eh, it doesn't matter. Just say you're going to do horrible, and as long as you achieve horrible, you're good. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the reality is that 
even before you make any plan, um, your company may have a minimum hurdle rate that, that's going to definitely put the pressure on to get to a certain level. Okay, so. thank you. Yeah. Curious about um, metrics that are NPV because I've seen examples of projects. A good one is I, I toured the USG underground gypsum mine in Shoals, Indiana. They're currently trying to prove out 100 years mm -hmm. of gypsum reserve, like you mentioned tabular stuff being uh, new talent optimization. But like if you use the standard NPV formula like that we've been doing in class, that isn't really that impressive. But at the same time, the idea that you could have a proven century of reserves sounds really attractive in the absolute sense. Yeah. How do you yeah. try and find better metrics, I guess? And I think... Again, I probably bias myself more towards the NPV world, but definitely when you get to things like industrial minerals, um, in, in the world of gold, you can produce more and sell it, whereas as, as you get to more of the bulk commodities, then it's a question of how much will the market allow you to produce, and then if you're talking about 100 years, in my mind, the question is, do you need to know exactly what year 90 looks like? Or is it enough to know that you've got 50 years, and in general, there's another 50 years, but we'll work out the details 25 years from now? And I think that, I'll just say that different companies will have different philosophies on, on how to measure that. And I think, again, it's, it's important for you to be in tune with how your company is measuring things, but also to keep your ears open to how our other companies are measuring it to see if you can get some diverse ideas. I guess if you are, like, kind of, you know, you set your target high and, and you're missing it by a little bit rather than that, that hit the target and the experience of having, like, got to how you uh, employees come over and help you guys out, what were some of the more specific changes was it an overall like culture shift? Was it just like totally re rethinking how you guys went about the mining process? Or... I, I think I would say we got to be better negotiators. <laughs> um, I, I'll tell a quick story about our one year, our chief operating officer basically made his tour of all the mine sites. And he had in mind what the corporate total needed to be to be the corp the, to be the corporate expectations. And he knew that Yanakocha had the most flexibility. And so when he got to the end of his tour, he said, okay, I, I see your plan. What would it take to get 200,000 more ounces? How many more trucks would you need? How much more plastic would you need? And I think we were so eager to please that maybe we didn't push back as much as we should have. Um, but there, there is another expert in the room right behind you. I don't know, Bill, if you want to comment on that type of story. <laughs> but you were, you were smiling at me too much, so. Steve and I worked together at yeah, a coach. He is one of the best mind planners I've ever been around. I think there's another approach to take it sometimes as well. And Steve and I also had roles where we were looking at corporate planning, a portfolio of mines across the world. Another approach is to look at characterizing each of those deposits, how do they act and behave in different in different price scenarios. And not necessarily just maximize NPV, but allow the flexibility that says, if this mine is very sensitive to prices, that I may want to design it differently than a mine that is not sensitive. So <laughs> my answer might be is to try and characterize and understand the deposit and then match that up with the planning environment that you're in. I think just another comment about that question or any question is, at your mind, it's really important to understand what are the constraints. And at Bhattagija, there was a really big mill which gave them a really fixed constraint on how many tons of water they could process. 
Yanacocha, everything was heat leach. So the only constraints were how much plastic would you put on the ground and how many trucks did you have? And so that lent itself to rapid growth with limited investment. And again, that made it hard to say no if somebody asked for more. Steve, would you mind uh, answering Corby's question? And then we've got Priscilla has a question as well. Yes. Uh, thanks, Corby. I, I would say that um, when when looking at projects that that do have a ramp up period, that I think the, the projects I've been around, that's a huge point of analysis to think about how many months does it take to get to 50% mill capacity, how many months to get to 80, 90, and 100. And so that is an area where people like Bechtel and Fleur have a lot of expertise in planning on those ramp up times. And it's also an area that once a plan is set in place, that being on time and on budget becomes really important. And one of the number one causes of being not on budget is being not on time, because then you've got all that construction crew there for extra, extra months as the costs continue to go beyond the budgeted amount. Thank you. Thanks, Priscilla. Am I up next? Yeah, go ahead, Priscilla. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Priscilla Nelson, one of the professors here. And I work a lot, a lot with tailings and mine closure. And there's a lot of discussion these days on tailings and mine closure. Can you hear me, Steve? No, Priscilla, um, it might be easiest if you type it in the chat. I'm sorry, the my, the my it's not computed. Or I can repeat it for you. Yeah, you can repeat it. Just say okay. tailings and mine waste management and closing um, are not considered early in the life of mine very often. And and there's a lot of discussion in the tailings industry about changing that so that people are thinking earlier about the costs associated with tailings management and planning. So she's talking about um, the tailings management isn't typically considered in the beginning stages of the planning process or early enough in the mine life, and that those are kind of an afterthought almost in terms of um, tailings management for the long term and mine closure. And we were kind of wondering um, what are your thoughts of when to incorporate them or how how well they're being incorporated? Is that right, Priscilla? Yes, and the basic sense is that NPV pushes everything off. NPV will never get um, a rational way of managing tailings. And she's saying that NPV um, pushes out any yeah. kind of... Yeah, I think the, the risk of using NPV for, um, or the risk of not using NPV in thinking about tailings and other closure costs is that, um, you're right, if you say, well, it's further out in the future, it's further out in the future, then from an NPV perspective, as long as you say the cost in 2020 is gonna be the same as the cost in 2030, then NPV won't, or we'll, we'll give you a big incentive to push that cost off till 2030. Um, what I've seen are two problems. Um, I, I would say that the projects I've been around have always thought about tailings costs. Um, they've always thought about reclamation costs. The two problems are we've tended to underestimate those costs. Because when you're planning a new mine, there's not a lot of actuals on what those costs are going to look like. Um, so as an example, when we talked about the sort of bit limit analysis, the, that was one of the key new directives was to make sure we were including enough dollars per ton for each ton that went on the leach pad, both to build the leach pad, but also to close the leach pad. Um, but again, the, the challenge is those costs sometimes get underestimated. The other big challenge is that if you think the cost is going to be $10 today, then in reality, 
that cost is going to be inflating maybe at the same rate as your discount rate. And in some cases, because standards keep changing, it may actually be inflating faster than your discount rate. And I think that that acknowledgement that some of those costs should be inflated and maybe inflated higher than your discount rate is not taken into account in some of our NPV work. Mm. But, but again, certainly thinking about closure costs, whether it's tailings, whether it's leach pads, whether it's pits, whether it's treatment of water in perpetuity, those are all really important things to get right in thinking about what is the true cost of making that pit just a little bit bigger. Yeah. Yep, it's a big discussion in the tailings world. She says it's a big discussion yes. in the tailings world. Yeah, and I think thank you for that. My hope is that I mean I know the tailings world is part of the engineering world, but hopefully those discussions will help improve practice over time. Um, in terms of metal prices, how does hedging affect um, you in mine planning affect your appetite for risk in terms of uh, you know, taking the best of the first or whatever that is? I think hedging sorry and hedging is a very emotional topic for many mining companies um, <laughs> and and I think again if we come back to that sort of price graph which um so some mining companies would say we've already hedged our price for a long time. I'm just going to use that price in my mine planning. Um, but in reality, if you've hedged your price, let's say you hedged your price at two thousand dollars, and gold is currently at fifty. Let's say hypothetically, gold was at a thousand dollars. Then, as a business person, you would have to ask. Why am I running my mine at two thousand dollars when I could just go out and buy gold bars and feed those into my contract? Um, so hedging, I would say, introduces new questions. It does buy some stability for a certain period of time, but eventually those questions are still going to come back to if the if the long term forecast is a thousand, why don't I just buy my gold from the corner jewelry store instead of continuing to operate a mine at a two thousand dollar mine line. So, Steve, a, a, excellent talk. And but, uh, we, we used to think that okay, we want to get our money back within three years. And so, don't you plan to do that? I think that's that is another metric that people look at besides NPV. Um, and the idea of, of, of trying to get your money back in a certain payback period is it's a really good practice. Um, bankers like if you, the yeah, bankers like it, um, if you're not sure what political party is going to be in power in three years or five years, that's another good reason to do it. Um, and, and sometimes most governments like it too, because Oftentimes, if you're still doing lots of depreciation, then the host government may not be getting taxes. Um, so it's another consideration that does go, doesn't always get factored into NPV or, or trumps NPV in some cases. If you don't get your money back for six years, I mean, people sort of look the other way. But if you're getting it back in three, you know, they're more inclined to put their money in. Yes. I, I do think there's a, for individual projects, maybe there is a tolerance for a longer payback period, but that's where a lot of the corporate planning work says, okay, maybe we've got one project that is still not paid back, but we better have some other projects that are, are totally free cash flow positive. And that's where sometimes bigger companies can take on some of the bigger projects that require a bigger upfront investment. 
as long as they're really confident in the mind life and they're confident in the government's ability. And, but I think a hundred years is is maybe a little bit too long to have to be confident in. for coming. I really appreciate it. Hopefully we see you guys all in the coming weeks. Um, we'll keep this up. And we have one really big announcement and I'm going to have you help me with it. Yep. Hey, go ahead. Tell me all about it. All right. So this past weekend, our mind competition team was in Australia competing in the annual event. We have a couple people here on the team who are stand up. Like, you give a round of applause. Like, all right, please. All right. Those very good performance in the school minds. We're happy to have been in school and do our best. And uh, if anyone here is interested in joining the team, we have a lot of graduating seniors. So please reach out to me. We also have an E-Days event. So I hope everyone's around for that. It's always a blast. That's all I got. Great job, guys. All right, with that, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time.